Welcome everyone. You have joined another edition of Live with the League with the Michigan Municipal League. I am Matt Bach, Assistant Director of Strategic Communications with the League. Uh, here today, I'm joined by uh, most of our Lansing staff. We have Jennifer Rigtrink, Harrisana Richards, and John Lamacchio. Welcome everyone. It's great uh, to have you all here today. Chris is out today, but he'll probably be back on our next edition in a couple of weeks. I uh, just want to jump right in. Um, just want to, again, remind people, if you do have questions for us uh, about the Americans Jobs Act, which we're going to talk about today, or, or the um, ele new election bills that we're going to talk about, or the housing issues, um, feel free to post those in the chat. Or if you have anything else on your mind, post those questions in the chat, and we'll get to those as we can. So, uh, Jen, we'll start off with you. Um, we had a busy week last week of regarding um, uh, housing issues, attainable housing issues. And you're part of a statewide housing coalition. Um, and there's also a kind of a related effort happening with uh, uh, MISHTA, Michigan State Housing Development Authority to form a statewide housing plan. So that seems to be a, a kind of a big topic right now. Our upcoming issue, our, our June, July, no, July, August issue of the Review Magazine, our, our league's magazine is also gonna focus on housing. So that's a big topic right now, Jen. Tell, tell us a little bit about what you're doing with this coalition and why this seems to be kind of forefront right now for a lot of people. Yeah, so the coalition is called the Housing Michigan Coalition and it's a diverse group of stakeholders. And I can drop a link to the coalition webpage for anybody who would like to join. And um, we do have a few of our members who have individually joined. Um, and then the executive committee is made up of the league the Home Builders, Grand Rapids Chamber, and Housing North. Um, I think everybody has been talking about housing um, in different, in their own different bubbles. And so this coalition has been nice to bring together um, the trades and also the, um, you know, Housing North talking about what's going over there, Grand Rapids Chamber, what's going on, and really with their businesses and not they're having jobs available, but then people are either turning those jobs down um, because they can't find acceptable housing, whether it's the affordability factor, whether it's just the um, what's available, um, where it's available, uh, if it fits their needs. Um, and so that's where kind of this coalition, this is something we've been working on um, since last fall. And last week, yes, there was a press release, um, which you can drop a link here in the chat as well. Um, and uh, some bills were introduced. And I'll tell you, um, I, there's not, with, with the goal of the coalition is that the bills, you're either supportive of your, or you're neutral. And there's many bills in there that in the past, um, have been pushed as preemptions or mandates. And um, us being part of the coalition, these are now um, not, they're not mandates, they're not preemptions, they're if this, then that. The local municipality gets to decide if they take advantage of the tool, um, you know, they get to set the parameters with the developer on um, being able to have access to um, some of the, the tools in there. Um, one of the bills that we'll, we're looking at getting introduced this week is allowing for pilots um, in communities, and, but you don't have to have HUD or MISHTA funding in the deal. Um, and so expanding that tool. So that is, uh, that's where we're at with that. Um, it's actually been very exciting and I think it's opened the eyes to um, a number of individuals within the coalition of why local government can't just pass out tax abatements like candy um, that you know those developments want services they want their trash picked up they want um, you know police and fire to show up if there's an emergency. And I think it's helped connect the dots on a number of things. And then as well as having conversations um, about, you know, the trades and how do we, um, how do we partner um, going forward to help um, with those, um, with the trades, with material costs to try to bring that, I guess, that factor down in the affordability of housing going forward. Yeah, Terry comments in here that we're, we're glad we're, we are not uh, supporting eroding local control. And obviously that's a big issue for us. Yes. <laughs> that's a big, important issue for us. I spend a majority us. of my time trying to <laughs> not <laughs> let them erode local control. And I know we've had a couple of our partners um, reach out that aren't happy about all of um, the bills in the package. And I mean, 
that's this is part of what we do. We have to negotiate to find a middle ground to get things done. And I think this definitely moves us um, forward. And so, like I said, there's some bills in there that we'll be neutral on, um, that there's some other organizations that they might want to push back on. And that's their free to do so. Um, but again, I think there's a lot of good get being done within that package that moves the needle. Yeah, we do have somebody asking to po post the link in there for joining, and I'm sure you'll do that. But I know we have at least, I think in the press release that we put out, we have at least three members that are already part of, signed up. But what does that mean if you join this effort? What does that tie you into or what does that mean? Yep, so you can join just to receive updates. And uh, as of lately, we've been sending out weekly updates just because there's been so much going on. So you can join um, or and you can also, you know, pledge your support to the coalition and submit your logo and you'll be listed on the website um, as a coalition member. Okay, good. All right. Um, and what about, uh, I, I know we did send out an email to our members a while back asking them to fill out a survey for the, the Michigan statewide housing plan that they're putting together. Can you talk a little bit about that effort? Sure. So Mishta has brought together um, a group of, I think there's 30 organizations or 30 plus looking at all the different facets of housing, whether it's affordability, um, whether it's trades, whether it's supportive or senior housing. Um, and they've been, we've been holding these coalition meetings, they call it, I believe, an advisory um, council. And the at the end of this, the point is to have a statewide strategic housing plan. Um, and so this ties in nicely that I think when we see the outcomes of, of Mishta's plan, the coalition can hopefully take on some of the actionable outcomes that they wanna see in there and help put together legislation if needed to, uh, to push that forward and get that done. Um, that's in the middle uh, I'd say the beginning to the middle of the process. Um, Mishta has been putting out um, a statewide survey that folks could share with um, different groups within their um, community asking about housing, whether you're an owner, a renter, um, the different factors um, around if you're having issues with housing. Um, and so we're expecting to see, I think that closed last week and they should be um, uh, having those results here soon to share with everybody. And then again, that will help guide um, this going forward. So there's definitely a lot about going on with housing right now. Yeah. Um, but I think these two, the housing coalition and then, you know, Misha doing their statewide housing plan um, are tracking nicely with each other right now. Yeah, we're planning to do an article, and like I said, in our July, August issue about that Mishta and, and the Housing Coalition work. Why do you think uh, this is such a, a hot topic right now? Is it because, does it have anything to do with the housing market? I know in my neighborhood here in Flint, the houses are, you know, put going on the market and having multiple offers within a couple of days. And I know that's happening all over the state and the nation. And that, of course, is raising housing prices, which, which makes attainable housing for, for everyone more difficult. Is that, is that, are they tied together, you think, or not? Well, I think, I think it's a lot of factors that are just starting to bubble over and collide with each other because we've been talking about housing and a number of groups have been talking about housing here for a number of years when it comes to access to housing, the affordability factor. Um, but you have the rising cost of materials. Um, I mean, the cost of wood and steel right now has, has gone up tremendously. Um, right. The lack of labor force um, is driving cost up. And so that's why you're seeing at the seller's market right now um, and things are turning over. But then when you factor in uh, the business sector and them uh, not being able to attract and retain talent because of either the lack of housing or not um, being able to afford the housing where they're at, or possibly what is available is not desirable. So I think you have talent, you have business, and you have community all coming together around housing right now. And, and that's really why now. And housing is something that is not partisan. Um, so if you look at at least the bills that we have introduced so far and that are coming, um, we have bipartisan bills, both chambers um, are pushing bills. We're really hoping that this is something everyone can coalesce again, uh, around and, and move forward without it becoming a political fight. Because housing is a factor, whether you're urban or rural, um, whether you're Republican or Democrat, like housing is, is a big issue right now for everybody. Right. 
Yeah, we talk about our community wealth building work and how we're really about trying to enhance the human experience in our communities and make it equitable for everyone. And this really, you know, directly relates to that effort. So it all kind of ties together really nicely. Uh, talking about uh, job creation and, and having uh, jobs out there, John, I wanted to shift to you. Uh, you've been following uh, the proposal uh, put out by uh, President Biden, uh, the American Jobs Plan. Uh, talk us a little bit about what this plan is. You did post a blog about it. And I'm sure we can post that in the link, kind of detailing all the different parts, but it's a huge package. Um, well, kind of what does it mean for our members? Yeah, it, it, it is a, a package, again, of, of significant financial si size. So we're talking you know, $2.3 trillion. And as one would suspect, there's always going to be the question about how to fund it and whether or not the president's proposal to do things like raise the corporate uh, tax uh, back to 28% uh, uh, is going to be a part of that or not. And there's already pushback there. But if, if we sort of set the politics of the issue aside for a second, and we actually think about the, the plan itself, a lot of times when we think infrastructure, we think, you know, roads, bridges, things like that. This really expands on the definite infrastructure in a similar way to which we've actually been talking about it here at the league recently in that community wealth building conversation to get into everything from roads and bridges, broadband, but it touches on workforce development, it touches on housing, it touches on small business. Uh, so there, there's a, a wide range of, of effects and impacts to this, but I think when we look at the plan, at least as, as in which the president has proposed it, um, there's money in there for lead service line replacement, which we know is a huge issue for, <clears throat> for our communities and enough money in there to replace every single lead service line that is still uh, you know, in existence in, in both the state of Michigan and across the country. So when you look at a commitment, not only from an infrastructure standpoint, but from a public health standpoint, uh, it incorporates a lot of things that gets into uh, electrification uh, as we look at, at vehicles and charging stations, uh, it deals with climate change and resiliency as it looks to further fund some of the things FEMA are doing on a proactive measure. And then, as I had mentioned, it's got some workforce development issue, housing issues in there to incentivize, you know, some of the, the housing that Jen actually was just talking about here in a very direct fashion. And then, you know, investment in, in schools and, and workforce development. So a broad ranging package with lots of things, lots of moving parts and no bills yet introduced around them yet, Matt, but we expect that to be coming sometime in the near future. Okay. I think you said maybe Memorial Day time, the end of May sometime, possibly. Yeah, I mean, this is very different than what we just went through with the American Rescue Plan, where where that was really sort of a modification of the HEROES Act that was previously introduced by, by House Democrats. So the ability to shape and modify something that was already in existence was much easier than what they're doing here, which is legitimately starting from scratch in the drafting process. So, you know, the president puts out his proposal. You're going to have, uh, you know, certain individuals that are going to lead the charge on this, both in the House and in the Senate. And they're in that drafting process right now, which is a really critical component for, for our advocacy, just so everybody knows, and why we continue to work with our partners like NLC, U.S. Conference of Mayors, and others uh, to specifically get involved in this part of it to, to make sure some of our issues are addressed on the front end, rather than having to work on negotiating those once those bills are already drafted. Okay. And you were quoted in Bloomberg uh, recently, a national online publication about kind of how part of this uh, American jobs plan really is kind of stems from the Flint water crisis. And you already kind of touched on the lead pipe issue. How do you see those two issues kind of connected? Well, I, I think, first of all, yeah, I mean, we were reached out to by Bloomberg. They really wanted to just take a general look at what was going on, but we really discussed more of the, the way in which that came about and, and really probably the, the unnecessary nature of it where it shouldn't have happened in the first place. Uh, and I don't mean the installation of lead pipes, but I mean, just getting to that situation where we were at in the city of Flint and many of our other communities have faced as we've talked about disinvestment. Uh, but I think what we're recognizing here is that there needs to be a priority placed on delivery of service and people rely on those services on a day-to-day -day basis uh, to perform either job functions, to stay healthy, to do a variety of different things. And so the clear recognition in here that we need to address this problem and not just address it as a way in which, you know, we'll give you a, a few dollars here, or a few incentives here, but in a true partnership between state, local and, and federal government, 
and significant investment uh, in this area will, will prove critical not only to our ability to replace that infrastructure, but also going forward to ensure the, the healthy practices that our communities care so much about as we deliver that service to, to our residents. Okay. Uh, back here in, in Michigan, uh, related to this, uh, we just uh, joined in a press release that was sent out today about the, uh, uh, the clean water plan, which was a, a couple packages of bills. Uh, we have our board president, uh, Mayor uh, William Weil, the mayor of Westland, is our board president, is quoted in that release, basically talking about how this investment can have a really positive long-term impact on our communities moving forward. Talk a little bit about this clean water plan, John, and, and uh, um, is, it is it related to the jobs plan? Or are they really separate issues, or how does that all kind of... Yeah, they're, they're really two separate issues. I mean, as, as you would suspect, you know, uh, since taking office, Governor Whitmer has talked extensively about providing clean drinking water to all Michigan residents. And and part of her efforts uh, was this Michigan Clean Water Plan that that she's come up with, which would essentially invest five hundred million dollars in a variety of different water sectors. And, and it's done in in two parts. Uh, one is is the reshuffling of some existing bond capacity that we have to specifically target you know wastewater and, and sewer infrastructure, some septic uh, issues that we have throughout the state. Uh, and then the other would be dealing with some federal funds as a way to get into some of that lead service line replacement and a couple of other components. And so uh, we discussed this bill internally with our with our committee. So there's probably some on the phone that, that got the email from me uh, about this. And we've elected to support uh, two Senate bills that are up in committee this week, Senate Bill 319 and Senate Bill 320, which are really gonna be the starting points for getting this plan off the ground and providing the authorization necessary to use those bond funds in a different way. Okay, good. And interesting. A lot, a lot going on. I'm going to talk with Harrison in a second uh, about the election bills, which is another big hot topic. Uh, before I do, I did want to remind our viewers that uh, we have a couple uh, weekender trainings coming up uh, April 30th and May 1st, so two days. Um, we have uh, uh, some space open for our advanced training and our core training. These are really important uh, trainings. They're virtual, so you don't have to leave the comfort of your own home. Uh, you can have to attend these safely. Um, but uh, you can go to our website, mml.org, um, and we, we'll post a link to those uh, trainings in, in the chat. But I did want to mention that before um, before I uh, moved on to Harrisana, and I see Harrisana just dropped off, probably your connection. So um, I did did have a couple of questions for you, Jen, while we're waiting for Harrisana to come on. One was about uh, the housing. It says, when discussing housing, we often cite unaffordable prices on mortgages, rent, upkeep, et cetera. Seldom do we touch on economic factors such as the wage stagnation and the role of minimum wage in being able to afford adequate housing. Is the league looking at other economic factors such as these to address the housing issues? Um, definitely. I mean, when we talk about community wealth building, it's really about looking through that equity lens. And so that is definitely conversations internally, as well as after this kind of first set of bills, but again, are just some tools in the toolbox um, uh, to be incorporated into um, that next factor. And that's definitely um, talking in the uh, MISHTA Advisory Council around the state housing. Um, there's a, a lot of talk around um, equity, um, looking at pay as well as past practices that may have uh, neg negatively impacted certain groups. Um, so yes, all of that is, is definitely being talked about at this point. Now solutions, um, that's still in the process of what are the best ways of getting at um, changing that or, um, oh, my, my audio's bad, Matt, <laughs> sorry. It's all right, it's not too bad. It's been worse, but it was getting a little choppy. So we'll go ahead and finish your sentence. Yeah, just definitely that is it's part of the conversation. We know okay. that that plays heavily into um, housing. Okay, great. Uh, so Harrisana, we got you back. I appreciate you coming back. On. So we're just getting ready to talk about the uh, election laws there. We wanted to focus on the election dates part, but as we know, there's a big package of bills out there that reform the election laws. Um, talk a little bit about uh, the election consolidation part and what that could mean for our members. Absolutely, Matt. And thank you team for holding it up while I had that little technical <laughs> issue. Uh, but yeah, lots of things going on in the elections front, as we've been talking about for weeks, we have been addressing the statewide audit, we've seen a large Senate elections, uh, large package come out of the Senate on elections, 
Uh, but this one today that we're focusing on is House Bill 4530 from Representative Kelly. That's part of a larger uh, package, but priority is her bill that would consolidate uh, the May and August elections into June, eliminate both of those existing elections and consolidate um, our election date so we would only have that one singular June election. So we have been with from the front of our clerks supportive of the concept of providing more efficiency for the elections process. Our clerks have shared that this would make it a lot easier for them to streamline their services, utilize resources better, and overall just make a more consistent schedule when it comes to administering elections in Michigan. However, you know, once this bill was drafted and we had conversations, we recognized that there are some concerns about eliminating an election for local governments, specifically um, from the standpoint of millages and bonding. It can be really difficult for communities if they lose one election to seek out projects long-term if they only have two elections to go from as opposed to three. And when it lines up with the scheduling of tax bills, we recognize that with a June election, our treasurers simply just don't have the time to get the information to remit their tax bills to the residents by July 1st. And so those were concerns that were raised to us both by our municipal and our township treasurers, which are very critical concerns. And we've been really appreciative that Representative Kelly, who's also the chair of local government, house local government, is working with us to address those concerns in the best way possible. Um, it's gonna be some brainstorming, but we definitely wanna make sure that we're not creating systems that eliminate structures for us to get revenue for our residents to complete projects and to move things forward. So we'll be looking carefully at that and we appreciate that even though those bills have moved through the house committee and through the house, we're still working on making those adjustments and addressing those concerns there. Separately, we have not seen that larger Senate elections package come up in the Senate yet. Uh, but we are anticipating to take a position on about 20 bills out of the 39, specifically focusing on legislation that impacts, of course, the operation of our clerks and holistically as local communities that administer the election, making sure that when we have elections in our community, they are accessible. People feel like they're able to get the information that they need and also that we're respecting the rights of our community to resource as needed. And that means you know, the ability to seek funds to administer elections or the ability to place drop boxes within the community in areas that we see fit. Um, just making sure that we don't have to, put, we don't put things in the way that prohibit our access to voting. We're tying it to community wealth and the work that we're doing here. We should make sure that our elections are accessible, that there are no additional barriers. And I think our big question for many of the bill sponsors who introduce those pieces of legislation is what are we trying to fix? How is this going to make accessibility easier, make people feel more included in the electoral process, and also ensure that our local communities have retained their autonomy on how to administer those elections? Okay. All right. Well, very good. Yeah, that's an interesting one. So there's a whole big package, and there's parts that we like, parts that we don't like. So it's kind of uh, it's going to be an interesting thing. And these are these some of these bills have been going in states all over the nation, right? Mm -hmm. No, and we've, we've seen different variations across different states and, you know, our bills aren't verbatim for what we saw in Georgia, but I think some of the intention is still there in a lot of ways. But for us, you know, we're focused on the operation. We're focused on facilitating elections that are fair, accessible, and intentional. And we believe that our communities have been doing that. And so we've read every single bill and we intend on taking an individual position on every single one. We're not gonna lump them all together, but there are definitely nuances in there that need to be addressed. And so we're looking forward to having those conversation about meaningful and intentional reforms that actually increase our engagement rather than potentially decrease it. Okay, and you said they haven't been, you haven't seen any committees or anything on these yet? Not yet. We've seen maybe one or two bills um, that may be connected to other pieces of legislation that have already been introduced. So for example, clerk training or, and things like that. But the large collection of those 39 bills that we saw introduced initially, those bills together have not been introduced yet. Okay. All right. Um, well, good. Uh, did wanna remind our uh, watchers a couple other things um, before I get into some of the questions. I do have a question about the ARP, the American Rescue Plan Act that will we'll field. Um, we have a couple other events coming up. I just want to remind everyone that the Community Excellence Award entries are due May 14th. So you have a little bit of time for that, but we're really hoping uh, to get some outstanding uh, projects. This is your chance to, to kind of brag a little bit about what's happening in your community and the outstanding innovative things you've done either related to COVID or, or just in general. We've, uh, this is a program we've had since 2007 that's uh, really kind of taken off 
Um, you get bragging rights for a whole year if you win that. So it's a pretty exciting program. You can go to our website, mml.org, and we got a, a, a post there about it right there. I'll post another link to that in there. And then we have our UP uh, Upper Peninsula Education Summit coming up May 13th. So if you're a member of the uh, in the Upper Peninsula and you want to attend that, uh, again, that registration is now open. Uh, John, a question we got uh, regarding to the American Rescue Plan was, um, I looked up the signing date for the ARP and it's March 11th and understand the state has 60 days to distribute funds unless Michigan asks for a delay. Do you know if they have made such a request? Yeah, so let me, um, let me just add a, a few details to that, that question there, Matt, and, and I appreciate it because this is something that, that continues to be top of mind for our members. So yeah, so the, the American Rescue Plan was signed on March 11th. According to that, there are 60 days in which the federal government has to distribute the funds. Um, and then those funds come in two tranches, as we had previously talked about. So each community will get 50% uh, upon the first distribution and the remaining 50% uh, after 12 months or 12 months after that first distribution. If you are an entitlement community, which there are about 40 in the state of Michigan, um, but most cities and most villages are not entitlement uh, communities in this state. But if you are entitlement, you will get your funds directly from the treasury. If you are non-entitlement, that money gets sent to the state of Michigan. And the state of Michigan then has 30 additional days in which to distribute that unless they they file for a, a hardship, which is at the heart of this question then, Matt. So really there's about a 90 day window, but as of, as of current conversations we've had with the administration and the way in which we know talks to be progressing here at the state level, uh, there is no, no uh, notice given to the federal government yet about a hardship uh, that is necessary. And currently at this moment, we are not anticipating one, but, I, uh, but don't hold me to that as things can change rapidly. Uh, with our state legislature and, and our governor, but right now that does not look to be the case. So we would anticipate all funds in the first tranche uh, to hopefully be delivered uh, around, you know, that that mid June, you know, first week and a half, two weeks in the in the June month. Okay. And do we have a, uh, any more in indication when the guidelines are going to come out? Yeah, this is uh, we we are waiting on the needles like like everybody else for this one and. We continue to hear, I was on a call again with the, the White House Office of Intergovernmental Affairs uh, last Friday. Um, they're anticipating that it's gonna come out you know, in, in the coming weeks, uh, which sticks with their original timeline somewhere around late April, uh, early May for, for that official guidance and, and for those official estimates for each community uh, to be out. So uh, we, we continue to, to you know, ask for your patience in this as, as we're waiting as well. Um, and as soon as we have that, and as soon as we have that official guidance from Treasury, you will be sure to see that in every way possible that we can communicate with you. Okay. And one of the questions is related to the villages, of course, which is a reoccurring question we've had. When do you expect to have the village share of the ARP funds? I'm guessing that's going to be in the same timeline as, as what you talked about. Yeah, same, same thing there. I mean, again, our communication with both the National League of Cities and, and, and with the White House and, and with the Treasury Department about the, the need to, to clarify uh, the, the original estimates that were out there. And then again, we know that almost every other state is dealing with the same issue, too, as, as there are different layers and forms of government. Uh, that the Congressional Services Office and the staff didn't have all the same information needed uh, to, to create those good estimates. Um, but we fully anticipate that those will be out uh, around here the, the end of the month, which I, which I know is, you know, 11 days away, you know, maybe early, early May. Um, and again, as soon as we have that, we'll make sure that we distribute that. Uh, but that specific uh, calculation is, is still not yet available. Yeah, we are planning a pretty uh, robust uh, communications plan around that when those guidelines come out. If you're not subscribing to our Inside 208 blog, uh, we would encourage you to do so. It's easy to go. It's free to subscribe to it. So whenever we post a new blog, and we'll surely post one about these new guidelines, you'll get an email notification on that. So um, that would be a good way to stay stay up to date on that information. Uh, Jen, we got a related question for you. I'm guessing, uh, does anyone know about the Homeowner Assistance Fund and the ARPA, uh, 50 million per state for delinquent mortgage payments? How will that roll out and how will it impact cities? And that might be John too, one of you guys. <laughs> 
Yeah, I haven't dove into um, that in the ARP, so I can I can look into that. And um, if that person wants to uh, send me an email and you can get some information, but no, at this time I know it's in there, but that's the extent of it. Yeah, Matt, I can add at least a little bit of context to that. Um, so in there, you know, the the requirement that each state gets at least uh, Fifty million dollars. The state of Michigan is actually getting about two hundred and forty-two million dollars out of this program, uh, and it is for more than just mortgages too. So it can also be used for utility payments, for gas, water, you know, electric, those types of things. And and in our conversations uh, with with the administration here in the state of Michigan, and and part of this is, you know, again the the legislature and the governor trying to come to an agreement on how to get these funds out the door and and things like that, but. We anticipate, and again, not, not to say that this will be 100% accurate, but at least when we look at like utility um, bills that, that may be in arrears, you know, there was a program that the state previously propped up with CARES Act dollars to help address it and look at arrears. We anticipate that we could see something similar to that. Um, you know, so in that case, the community got the funds directly uh, as a way in which to address the, those delinquent payments. You know, as we look on the, the homeowner side, obviously that wouldn't be a direct payment to the community, but when we think about the impact uh, that it could have on our individual communities, and again, tying that back to our conversation around community wealth building, there'd be a lot of advantages there to making sure that people don't get so far behind that they either lose their homes or get evicted uh, when the moratorium on evictions uh, is, is is over. Um, you know, so those are the, the the types of things that are out there that we're watching very closely, but don't have a definitive answer on. But know that it will have either a direct or indirect uh, impact on our on our members in their communities. Okay, we did get another question uh, related to the ARP. Again, it says uh, we have a detailed break. This is from Facebook. A detailed breakdown of what we can actually spend the ARP money on yet, and how the revenue replacement works. Um, again, John, this is the, probably related to the guidelines that haven't come out yet, but. Yeah, and, and I mean, we fully anticipate, and, and I know that it is, it is tough to continue to wait uh, on these questions and, and having them, you know, sort of unanswered and, and lingering out there. Uh, but I think the, if, if there is one silver lining in that, uh, the White House and, and the Department of, of Treasury is doing everything they can to not have that same rolling guidance uh, impact that we saw with, with the CARES dollars, where you got one set of guidance, you know, one week, and then a week later, or two weeks later, you know, it was changing, and then we had a different assumption that we had to had to address and deal with. So they're trying to get everything done and, and organized and put into its most complete form, and again, that anticipated deadline for when that'll be out will obviously be before May 11th when the funds have to be distributed, but sometime late April, early May, we should have some very clear uh, direction from, from the U.S. Department of Treasury on that. Okay. Uh, Harris Adam, we got a question related to you regarding the election bills. Um, uh, it's more of a comment and a question, I guess. I hope the league has city clerks front and center in the conversation about these election bills. Resident and voters trust their city and township clerks. Their statements about some of these proposed bills would be impactful. No, absolutely. And I apologize if I didn't stress earlier that, you know, we work closely with both the Michigan Association of Municipal Clerks. And in addition, we have it, uh, established this term, an elections committee that is made up of our municipal clerks, as well as members of our municipal services committee that are very vested in the elections, the operation of elections in our community to give us a fine tooth comb look over these bills and also be our North Star on identifying where we need to lean in on these issues. So we are 100% behind our clerks and believe that they respond, they facilitate elections well in the state of Michigan and we denounce any idea that implies that they do otherwise. Uh, and additionally, we make we want to have that group within our organization to both highlight the responsibility of the clerks and how it works in concert with city managers, city council members, mayors, and everybody else who collectively in the community is part of establishing safe elections. And so once we formalize our positions, we will definitely be more vocal and more public about where we'd like to be. And like I was stressing before of community wealth building, this is immediately connected to that. You, know, you cannot feel belonging or engagement or pride or ownership in any of the other pillars that we support if you don't have access to meaningful elections. And that means one, 
removing any sort of pretense that communities are irresponsible in their facilitation of that, and also ensuring that they have access to any of the resources they choose to use to facilitate their elections and mm -hmm. not putting any parameters on when ballot boxes can be open or how funds can be used or permissions from county and state. We do elections right and we're gonna affirm that. Um, so we're really proud to have folks who have been on our election subcommittee who have been here with us since the start helping us all along the way. And I also want to shout out as well to our public safety subcommittee. Similarly, many issues related in that area. We're seeing a lot of legislation come through that can get highly political and sometimes irresponsible. And we want to make sure that we have our folks grounded in what we need to do to appropriately facilitate those services in our community. And really quickly, Matt, I did want to highlight uh, one bill that will be probably moving very quickly through the legislature. Um, going back to last uh, fall, winter during lame duck, we passed MI Clean Slate and it included several pieces of legislation that uh, made us more justice focused, justice compassionate in how we deal with the criminal justice system and the long-term outcomes on our residents. One of the pieces of legislation that came out uh, eventually is PA 393 of 2020 was to, change certain violations rather than being immediate arrest to appearance tickets. So if there's, you know, certain circumstances, if a crime happens and someone intervenes, intervenes with police, they would be given a ticket to appear in court rather than being incarcerated at that moment, saving time, money, and a lot of um, other just structural instances and for a lot of crimes that maybe don't need somebody to be detained in jail. However, there was an oversight as it pertains to OWIs operating while intoxicated that was left out. Um, I wanted to acknowledge our municipal attorneys, especially the mamas for flagging this for us, uh, mentioning that this would be a big concern for our law enforcement, for our police to have individuals who are operating while intoxicated just be given the parents ticket and to go on. So that is being codified in House Bill 4627 from Representative Julie Brixey. I'll be in House Judiciary tomorrow, but it adds that OWIs are not included within uh, certain instances that can be given the parents ticket. And also in the bill, it delegates to local ordinances that support those uh, sort of parameters as well. So I hope our folks will be relieved, especially our public safety folks who had some concerns about um, operating in that. And so that will likely go um, go forward through the house and be implemented immediately since those changes in my clean slate were implemented April 1st. Good, thank you. And you referenced the mamas, that's not our, our mothers, that's the Michigan Association of Municipal Attorneys. Uh, they've been very active on this. So I appreciate uh, giving them a shout out as well. A um, couple questions. One uh, regarding, I can never pronounce the acronym, the PSPHPR. I think that's from last year. Uh, any update on timing of getting the final payment for that? Anyone know? You know, I, I don't know that, Matt, to be, to be honest with you. Um, I know it's something that, that I can check uh, with Chris, and he might uh, know that off the top of his, his head, but uh, it's something we can absolutely look in and, and see if we have some additional information to make that known to our members. Okay. And going back to the ARP, any, any word on getting a, a, a dollar figures for villages? That's a question that we've had before. Yeah, again, I, I think that falls right back in line with, with what we're looking at here uh, to have that officially from Treasury around the end of this month, early in, in May. And as soon as we have something that we know is, is sound and, and accurate, uh, we will make sure we distribute that to our members so they can be fully aware of what, what's happening. Okay. Um, we have a long comment here about the voter education being really important. I think it's a good uh, point here. It's got some examples in there. I'm not gonna, doesn't, I don't see a question in there. So um, any other things, Betsy, I'm missing before we get ready to wrap up. Any other questions? Nope, you've covered everything so far. All right, guys, uh, anything from you guys that uh, topics that uh, we should talk about? Go ahead, Jen. I was just going to mention last week the mask and gathering order um, was updated and um, and really the biggest change in there was masking um, of, of, of kids two years old and older um, public meetings are still exempt um, and all the other restrictions um, are still applying. So. Um, just wanted to mention that that it has been extended. Okay, very good. Uh, Harrisana, did you have something? Okay. Uh, so another... Matt, right. Yeah, Matt, I, I want to add two things. One, a little bit uh, in, in addition to what Jen's talking about there. I, I know 
you know, organization we have tracked and, and shared with, with members uh, consistently some of the orders that have come out either from the governor, from the Department of Health and Human Services. And currently at this time, uh, every indication that we're getting is that the governor is not going to be adding any additional restrictions. Um, and, and, so. and really what has been asked is that we can just continue to be you know, diligent on mask wearing and social distancing and hand washing and, and all of the other you know, safety procedures that are out there to help prevent the spread. But the other thing, though, that the governor specifically had reached out to us about, and, and we posted a blog on this, is with the recent surge in viruses in the state of Michigan, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services has been looking to put together some pop-up testing sites. And so uh, I posted a blog the other day that would allow communities that might be interested in hosting it because maybe they have a parking lot at City Hall that they could use, Maybe they have a large indoor facility that they have access to where people could come in and, and get tested. So there's a short, you know, eight to 10 question survey that you can fill out, identify that you are interested in maybe hosting a pop-up testing site. Uh, and then the, the one thing that everybody should be, a note, should be aware of if they do go to fill out that survey, it is geared both towards municipalities like our members, uh, but also retail. So one of the question talks about, hey, would you be able to offer a coupon or a 5% discount? Obviously that wouldn't uh, apply to, to directly to local government and more in the retail setting, uh, but just know that that question's there. Don't be uh, concerned or confused by that. But if you are interested in, in hosting a, a pop-up testing site, uh, we can post that link into the chat and uh, individuals can go in and look at that and, and fill out that survey if they're interested. And then the other thing I would mention, Matt, is we have promoted consistently, at least over the years that I've been here, uh, what started as Tiger Grants and then as Build Grants and now our, our RISE Grants uh, from the federal government, which are uh, grant dollars that are available out there for significant infrastructure projects. Uh, and this year, um, the U.S. Department of Transportation is putting a emphasis on uh, sustainability and equity in those projects. So projects can be up to $25 million and no state can get more than uh, $100 million out of that billion dollar uh, program. So again, we posted a blog on that. We can post that here in the chat. And for those that are interested, uh, they can look into that and, and see what the federal government's doing if they have a project that would qualify. Okay. All right. Thank you, John. Uh, Jen, there was a follow-up question. I know you addressed it in the chat, but I did want to get it in case all the people didn't see it. The question was, what do you mean by public meetings being is exempt from the mask order? And you kind of explained what you meant by that. Right. Um, during the last update to the gathering the face mask order, um, public meetings were exempt from the, I think it was like 25 or 30 attendees. Um, and so it's, everyone has to wear masks and socially distance, but the capacity is 50% of whatever the, the room can hold. And so sorry if that was confusing. I did post um, the actual updated order in um, the comments so people can um, review that and should review that um, most updated okay. order. Good, thank you. Uh, one other question from Facebook. Uh, any discussion about money that might be made available for local police to hire or train mental health officers? And then I guess Representative Breen posted a comment related to that. Um, there are a few pilot programs and the bones of a legislative package being put together for mental health um, and uh, responders for police. Uh, anyone wanna kind of clarify or explain on that? Sure, and thanks, Rep. Green, for that the update and filling it in there. Correct. Uh, DHHS does have several programs that they are operating in pilots. Um, I know that not exactly sure which legislative package. I do know there's conversations of a legislative package. Additionally, Senator McBroom has Senate Bill 101 that he's been working on for some time uh, that would give counties the ability to contract out transportation services for mental health transports, which can be huge especially for our rural communities, um, our communities in the Upper Peninsula, where they may have a limited, a very specific number of officers available and having to deploy them to make the five, six, seven hour drive downstate to get people to facilities does take an additional strain um, and, and just timing off of the community and the, the officers as well. And so that's something he's hoping to alleviate there too um, in the systems and process. Uh, also in the governor's budget recommendation, we have advocated our support for, I believe it's $15 million to go to public safety to support uh, the hiring and retention of public safety officers. 
in our communities as well. Okay, uh, I think uh, this question is related to that. Where can we find a summary regarding the law enforcement changes being proposed slash implemented? Is there a summary of these out there somewhere that we know of? Um, so I may need a little bit more clarity and Leslie, please feel free to contact me offline, but I do know we have um, our, we have the budget recommendation that was provided by the state budget office that we can provide of the overview of that. Uh, we can also share some of the programs that we have available um, that we know of that are available through DHHS. And I can also pass along um, a summary of Senate Bill 101 to get an idea of what that piece of legislation does. So happy to help answer that question of what, what information she's looking for. Okay, good. All right, well, that should do it. I do wanna remind everybody that our next Live with the League will be May 3rd. And once again, please, uh, if you uh, wanna brush up on your, your training as an elected official, we have those oh, two weekenders and one at kind of a core level. Um, and then also an advanced weekender training that is April 30th, May 1st. I did post a link in the chat to those. Uh, and don't forget about our CEA uh, entries being due May 14th. Um, anything else, any last parting words from our team? All right, I see heads shaking. So thank you everybody for joining us. We had a great uh, chat, good, good attendance today. Great questions, thank you everybody. Uh, until next time, we will see everyone, bye.